Uh, the lectureship was established in 1978 by a gift from uh, Margaret's son, Dr. Andrew Sorensen, BD class of 62, to provide for an annual series of lectures on politics and ethics. Uh, while it's customary for Dr. Sorensen to join us, he regrets that he's unable to attend this year. Previous Sorensen lecturers have included John Danforth, David Price, George McGovern, Beverly Harrison, Richard John Newhouse, uh, Stanley Hauerwas, Richard Malaika, George Rupp, and Salama Shaker. To introduce tonight's lecturer, I'm going to call on Emily Towns. Emily? J. Cameron Carter is Associate Professor in Theology and Black Church Studies at Duke Divinity School in the great city of Durham, North Carolina. That's my hometown. <laughs> he investigates the complex forms of identity, especially around race, gender, and nationalism that have come to mark us all. He is particularly interested in the implication of Christian theological thought forms and the specific deployment of Christianity's social imagination in these identity and social formations, the formations we all inhabit. Combining critique and an enduring deep belief in reconstruction, Carter is engaged in a constructive enterprise by redirecting Christian identity and Christianity's social imagination, refusing to allow it to be defined in the ways that have become, it has been in the modern world, and in some of the worst ways it continues to be defined. In short, Professor Carter engages questions of identity, politics, history, cultural and social criticism, film criticism, and the like as part of the pressing task of voicing a new religious and social imagination, social Christian imagination for the 21st century. Author of the much talked about, much battered, about, bantied about race, a Theological Account from Oxford, 2008, and numerous essays and articles, he is completing a new book entitled The Secular Jesus, Religion and the Project of Civilization, which is forthcoming from Yale University Press. As afternoon leans into evening, Dr. Carter's Sorensen Lecture is entitled The Disorders of Love, a Meditation on the Theological Phenom. Please join me in welcoming him back to Yale once again. Well, I am very uh, pleased and grateful, gratified to be here once again. Um, I was here basically uh, a month ago, more or less, um, as a part of the great celebration uh, around Dr. Kelsey's uh, fine work, eccentric existence. So I'm very pleased to be here once again and um, to see him and many of you, uh, Professor Towns, uh, Dean Attridge, and, and, and many others that I recognize here. I'm very, very grateful for your kindness in inviting me and for your willingness to sort of hear me try and think out some, some thoughts I've been wrestling with. Hopefully, as well, you give me some, assist some assistance as I try to continue to think them out. Okay, um, my, my talk uh, uh, was titled, as I turned it in, The Distortions of Love, A Meditation on a Theological Phenom. And um, I, I like that title, though. I've been playing with something else, so I I'll, I'll trot this out and see how this works as well. And once I get to the end, you can let me know which one works better. Um, here's the other title I've been playing with, uh, Phenom's Prayer. Uh, colonialism and the logic of salvation. Um, let me begin this way. Only 26 years of age at the time, the young Martinican intellectual Franz Fanon, a figure well known in various fields of theological inquiry in the humanities, concluded his 1952 manifesto, Black Skin, White Masks, in a quite unexpected, if not strange, way, foiling the expectations of many who have turned to him, his revolutionary ideas, and indeed to this book for inspiration, 
and assistance in addressing the modern condition, Fanon offers this benediction to a text that was born both in and out of season. This is the benediction to black skin, white mast. Quote, at the end of this book, we would like the reader to feel with us the open dimensions of every consciousness. My final prayer, oh my body, always make me a man who questions. With these words, Fanon first summarizes the prescriptive dimensions of his wide-ranging and highly textured argument. I won't enter at this present moment, this moment right here, into a full analysis of what he prescribes just at the moment when the French-Algerian War was about to begin in French colonialism and the vision of universal man, capital M, on which it was premised was facing its demise. I'll have an opportunity for commenting on Fanon's analysis of the colonial problem and his prescription for pressing beyond it as my talk progresses. I will simply gloss his prescription here as contained in this penultimate sentence of his book by saying that Fanon would have us understand that in black skin, white masks, he has been about the work of reclaiming the psyche or the collapsed ego of the colonized. He wants to think toward the decolonization of affect, subjectivity, and agency. To do this, he intervenes throughout black skin, white masks in the structures of knowledge that have aided and abetted the creation and the freezing of the black into an eternal essence sealed into a past, a history of primitivism that is conceived as sheer past and therefore as ever dying and passing away. Whiteness as the future that secures the present and, um, and that all must live into. Blackness as sheer past, as evil, and for this reason as that which is socially dead and therefore ever poised on a precipice of actual death. It is this Manichaean relationship that Fanon wants to diagnose and find a way to exist beyond. He does so by mobilizing a battery of conceptual resources from psychoanalytic theory to Hegelian philosophy and its offshoots in existentialism and phenomenology to literary and film criticism to do so. However, none of Fanon's discursive analyses has been to the exclusion of affect. Indeed, he appeals in the penultimate sentence of black skin, white masks to his readers to feel their way with him towards a new humanism, towards a humanism beyond Western humanism, which is to say a humanism beyond war. He appeals to his readers to think with him towards a decolonial humanism in which subjectivity and agency are disalienated from the colonial and racial legacies in the um, colonial and racial legacies in which the human has been embedded. The humanism he starts to develop throughout black skin, white mass suggests that what might be, suggests what might be called a borderless subjectivity. Or in Fanon's own words he, words, he speaks, quote unquote, of the openness of every consciousness to the consciousness of an other an openness that requires liberating the ego of the colonized from the mass attack to which it has been subjected by the colonizer and in colonialism. As feminist philosopher Kelly Oliver has argued, Fanon's humanism calls for nothing less than the decolonization of psychic space that goes along with decolonizing territory and land or physical space. Okay. That's the first thing that he does in this conclusion, this, this way he ends the book. The second thing he does in his benediction comes out in the last sentence. And I contend that it is here that Fanon the revolutionary throws us back on our heels. For if the penultimate sentence appeals to affect, to feeling, the final sentence of his manifesto appeals to religion. Indeed, it appeals to prayer. Here, prayer is, in some sense, centered on and addressed to the body. Oh, my body, make me always a man who questions. 
For Fanon, prayer is the site of the body. Prayer brings the body, particularly the black body, and its unique lived reality into focus. But this isn't all. Fanon says in this provocative ending, which is literally the text's last word, that it is his final prayer, quote unquote, in his final prayer, thus suggests it is his final prayer, thus suggesting that there were prayers preceding this final one throughout the book. Prayers addressed to, or perhaps better, prayers addressing or dealing with the body, taking it as the point of new departure for life for all, the place of a new universal, the universalism of the human as such. Oh, my body, always make me a man who questions. This Fanonian prayer, I contend, is but the resounding amen of an extended psalm-like encomium of the body, a prayer uttered from inside of the Holy Saturday of negritude, from within what Fanon, following Amy Césaire, called in the beginning of his book, Black Skin, White Mass, he's quoting um, Amy Césaire, a descent into the veritable hell of blackness in modernity. This Holy Saturday, this descent into, hell of, into the hell of black abjection, the place of the wounds of coloniality is not to be avoided. Fanon resists the forgetfulness of being, the forgetfulness of oppressed being, there must be memory, for it is from the memorial site of abjection that a genuine new departure, a resurrection for all, and not just for the black, but for the black and the white, can emerge. It is from this new site that we yearn for a state of grace, as Fanon puts it a few years later in the text towards the African Revolution, it is towards this new state of grace that the colonized yearn, even for a new situation, to quote him again, of forgiveness. What do such invocations of the religious, indeed of the theological, mean from the pen of one who in his own short lifetime, he died, I believe, at the age of 36, and in his afterlives has been variously called and named, even caricatured, I might add, the apostle of, of violence, the prophet of, violent third, of a violent third world revolution, the prisoner of hate, the preacher of the gospel of the wretched of the earth. Black skin, white mass tells the story of an intellectual conflict, the conflict of a split consciousness in which a colonized class of black intellectuals assimilated the values of the white French community, though it was never really socially accepted despite that assimilation. And all, and all the while, the rest of the non-white population, non population suffered mass discrimination. These elites had mastered the French language and thereby mastered French culture or all things French and European. Their Latin was impeccable. Educationally, they were without spot or blemish. And yet, as one of the founding French educated blacks the, um, the, as they were then called of the negritude movement, Leopold Senghor observed, we still could not strip off our black skins. We have become reduced to wearing white masks. It is this situation that Fanon diagnoses. But my question this evening is, what are we to make of how Fanon narrates the problem? What is to be made of the fact that the analysis and story of the black in relationship to the white is told theologically, if you will, inside of the trigeral mortis. That is from the place of the real hell and pain of the colonial situation as a situation of social death, a mode of quote unquote life that is suspended between the ongoing internment of black suffering humanity which bears an eternally renewed cross, that's a quote from Césaire, um, on the one hand, and a prayerful resurrection of the body, the black body, on the other hand. My talk enters into this unexpected and under-theorized Fanonian moment, the moment that I'm calling the theological Fanon. It is from, from the sight of the black body 
that I announced Fanon as a new conversation partner for religious studies generally and for modern theology particularly and especially, a partner whose ideas have hardly ever, if at all, been engaged as windows onto the enduring colonial wound of Christian theology and Christian existence today. More specifically, by privileging black skin white masks concluding and prayerful encomium to the body or the cry of grace and forgiveness found in toward the African Revolution, I want to open up a religious but ultimately a theological reading of the Fanonian enterprise. That's to say this talk meditates on what I should like to call the theological Fanon in which I aim to address, to borrow a phrase from my Duke colleague Walter Mignolo, Christian theology's inadequately diagnosed and insufficiently addressed colonial wound and in so doing deep in arguments only gestured toward in my book race a theological account. Here I begin to think toward an analysis of the crisis of coloniality and even post-coloniality within Christian theology and towards the decolonization of theology and the Christian imagination. If you don't mind, just get a little sip of water here. The claim I place before us this evening is this. Fanon's black skin, white masks exposes that colonialism and the racial, gendered, sexualized world into which the human is thrown in colonialism rests on and enacts a problematic logic of salvation. It exposes colonialism as soteriological in character and discloses the logic of salvation that it enacts and the mechanism by which it functions. That is to say, colonialism and the Manichaean world it creates, a world dichotomized between colonizer and colonized, between the white masculine and its black or non-white others, is an ordo salutis oriented around a false and imperial God-man whose aim is nothing less than the domination or the saving of all space, perhaps most subtly and tyrannically even down to the level of psychic space or the domain of the ego. This is done by converting, quote unquote, uh, Fanon argues, the colonized into a kind of quintessence of evil that must be overcome and the residual of what's overcome saved. Colonialism, Fanon contends, is the materialization of this Christian program of salvation at the heart of which is a new visitation of what, if I can draw on the language of the early church, the kind of patristic era, what can be dubbed the Christological problem. Colonialism is a new visitation of the Christological problem. What Fanon's analysis points to is this new modality of the Christological problem, that it turns on the problem of the imperial God-man. Fanon points to the problem of the imperial God-man or the problem of the imperial masculine functioning as and taking on God-like qualities in the following remark in The Wretched of the Earth, in that book written in the context of the Algerian War. Within the colonial situation, and this is a quote from Fanon, within the colonial situation, the customs of the colonized, their traditions, their myths, especially their myths, are very, um, are very much, are marked as indigent and of innate depravity. This is why we should put the poison agent, DDT, which destroys parasites, carries diseases on the, on the same level as Christianity, which roots out heresy, natural impulses, and evil. To continue the quote, the decline of yellow fever and the advances made by evangelizing form part of the same balance sheet, he says. But triumphant reports by the missions, in fact, tell us how deep the seeds of alienation have been sown among the colonized. I am talking of Christianity, and this should be of no surprise to anybody. Listen to what he says here, because I'm going to be playing with this in many ways throughout everything I, I say subsequently. He says this, the church in the colonies is the white man's church, a foreigner's church. 
it does not call the colonized to the ways of God, but to the ways of the white man, to the ways of the master, the ways of the oppressor. And as we know, in this story, Fanon says, many are called, but few are chosen. End quote. This is a very important quote that in effect narrates coloniality and Christianity as in a deep symbiotic relationship. To be dealing with the one is to be dealing with the other. For they are, one might say, the mirror stage of each other. Indeed, this important passage figures colonialism as an ecclesial order of alienation, an ecclesial order of alienation, as a churchly structure of war and violence, of death and destruction. Colonialism tirelessly destroys, quote unquote, the indigenous social fabric and demolishes unchecked the systems of the invaded country's economy, lifestyles, and modes of dress. It does so by aligning them with, and here, note the theological and the doctrinal conceptualities that Fanon mobilizes, by aligning them with what Fanon calls the heretical, aligning them with pure nature as opposed to grace, aligning them with innate depravity, aligning them with evil and the demonic. In showing how within the colonial, the logic of, colo of, the, of the colonial modern world, the black man, as he puts it in black skin, white mask, is the symbol of evil, quote unquote, Fanon is capturing how the figure of the black is fundamentally an invention. The result of a fiat, a let there be. The black is the act, is the result of an act of creation produced inside of a Christian logic. More specifically, the destruction of the indigenous entails simultaneously the invention or the making of the black. It's in this sense that Fanon says at one point in Black Skin, White Mask, again laden with theological language, that the black is quote unquote a crucified person, a figure of the cross. The black is a figure of exclusion. Indeed, the black's exclusion within the order of things is the black's inclusion for the purpose of exclusion. Another name for this is simply death. Being a crucified person, the black, Fanon would have us understand, is that social figure of death. The black is a death-bound subject, a figure caught within the dynamics of social governance as pastoral power, as Michel Foucault might say, a figure caught within, to quote Ishil Mbembe, uh, the necropolitics of bare life. The task of Christianity and colonialism, which had come to be deeply articulated to each other after an almost 500 year history, was to manage, though not completely get rid of, this evil figure of death for the sake of life. The black names a relationship then to the white, life related to death. And this relationship for Norm, and this relationship for Norm points to in the quotes that I gave earlier is a relationship in which, to use the Pauline vocabulary, salvation is being worked out with fear and trembling as a form of salvation that consists in striving to magically turn into the white. Thus colonialism, Fanon would have us understand, is indeed a vocation, another laden theological term. We must hear in this language of vocation, the language of calling. As St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, those whom God has called to Jesus Christ, God has justified. And those God has justified, God will glorify. This, of course, begs the question of what is to be understood here under the sign God. And this is precisely where Fanon's remark in The Wretched of the Earth is so interesting. For the colonial situation is a situation of calling by a God. It hails the colonized, calling, uh, calling him or her, the colonized, to be like Jesus. 
But inside of the calling to be like Jesus, Fanon says, the colonized are called not to the ways of God, but to the ways of the white man, to the ways of the master, the ways of the oppressor. And as we know in this story, many are called, but few are chosen. Or stated differently, inside of the call to be like Jesus, the call to, the call to order one's life mimetically or imitatively as an imitatio Christi um, of the God of the colonized, you, one is also being called to be like the imperial God-man. Fanon set for himself in black skin, white mass, the task of unearthing the mechanisms of precisely this calling, this hailing that goes out to the colonized. And he wants to examine the internalization of this very hailing as the collapse of the ego for the colonized and the social neuroses that arise out of it. That's to say he wants to interrogate the logic governing this order of creation, redemption, and eschatology. He sees an ordo salutis in which whiteness is positioned as that future which is ever coming and to which the non-white must enter but can never really do so for they cannot escape their black skin. I offer a reading here of Black Skin, White Mask, in fact, I've already started to do so, that brings to the forefront the logic of salvation that we can say Fanon discerns inside of colonialism. Okay, I'm gonna skip this part here because I wanna make sure I leave time to get through everything, but it's basically a recapitulation of what I said. So, picking up at another point. Now, uh, before my argument moves any fo more forward, before I take it any further, I want to be clear about one little thing methodologically. I'm not a person that, try to get too caught up in, in methodological concerns. They're important, but sometimes I just sort of like the method to arise out of the actual practice of, of theology, doing the theological work. But I do have one little methodological caveat that I do, I do want to put on the table up front. While Fanon does not engage the discourse of Christian theology beyond his loaded deployments of its conceptual and doctrinal key words, shall we say, he doesn't engage Christian theology in the way he engages, say, Hegelian philosophy in the discourses of psychoanalysis. He does nevertheless, shall we say, engage, quote unquote, Christian theology. He engages it in this sense, as he says, Christianity is but the other side of colonialism's balance sheet. And so to engage colonialism and the compartmentalized and Manichaean world of alienation it produces is to be within the Christian imagination, imaginary already. This is precisely because of the degree to which um, Christianity and modernity and coloniality are articulated to each other. My project, insofar as it engages Fanon, brings to the surface or renders explicit the logic of salvation that is internal to the account of colonization that Fanon is intuiting. In this sense, Fanon is a theorist. Um, it, Fanon's is a, Fanon is a theorist not just of coloniality, but more specifically of Christianity's colonial wound. Moreover, while I am cognizant that Fanon has no love for Christianity for understandable reasons, I nevertheless will be contending that the project of disalienation, the project of freeing subjectivity and agency from its Manichaean shackles, is, I sort of have been italicized here, I'm trying to convey that with my emphasis, is itself theological in character. I want to argue here that Fanon's constructive proposal suggests a post-Christian po post possibilities for Christianity. It suggests a post-theological mode of the Christian theological thinking. This is not the post-liberal return of theology after the demise of liberalism or the post-secular return of religion after the demise of the secular. This is not that post. This is a decolonized Christianity. A Christianity, a decolonized Christianity that witnesses, um, yes, that, that has for its witnesses the wretched of the earth. Okay, I'm not going to go any more further than that methodological issues, but I'm more than willing to entertain them if you have questions when we get to Q&A. So let's get into the meat and potatoes a little bit. Um, if, if we take what I've laid out as something of a sweeping overview of the arc of my presentation of the theological phenomenon, 
a Fanon who tries to think through the mechanisms of colonialism as an ordo salutis, um, or as the materialization of a Christian logic of salvation, and whose prayerful encomium of the body witnesses to the renewal or resurrection of subjectivity, not just that of the black, but of the white, and for all in between as well. If we take this as what I have sort of given us a summary of to this point, then what I want to do now is track his analysis of the condition of the black as a death-bound or crucified figure whose life is, quote unquote, winded under the geometric weight of an eternally renewed cross. It's a quote taken from Amy Césaire, his Fanon's friend and teacher. The work wherein Fanon most extensively theorized the soteriological existence of the black within the Manichaean world of colonialism is black skin, white masks. This rich text defies easy summarization. But what can be said is that the, accumula that the cumulative effect of its many arguments amount to an inquiry into why it is that, the colonial, that in the colonial situation, the native, the black, acts in a way that is akin to the neurotic. The black exhibits neurotic symptoms in how the black is forced to act in a white colonial world. The black must obey the call to imitate the white if the black is to acquire recognition. Indeed, the black is in a crisis of recognition, a crisis because mimicry or imitation, the quest to be white in order to be recognized, always fails in some basic sense. It fails because despite wearing the white mask, there is always the black skin. That is to say, within the colonial order of things, the black cannot escape blackness. Fanon argues that to understand, that to understand um, this mimicry, make sure I got my space here. Yeah, to understand this mimicry that comes from the colonial situation and the allure of imitation, the seduction to internalize uh, this, this call to imitate um, on the part of the white, to uh, on the part of the black, to understand this, one must grapple with the anti-black society in which the, imitate, the call to imitate comes, the world into which the black is born. This is the real neurosis that must be diagnosed, argues Fanon, but that can only be understood only um, as we venture into the lived experience of the black. A modified form of psychoanalysis, one bent in the direction of becoming a psychoanalytic theory of oppression, as, Al as Kelly Oliver has put it, is uniquely suited to helping us understand the situation of the black and the inferiority complex produced of the encounter with the white in the quest for recognition born of that encounter. It must be said that Fanon's privileging of the psychoanalytic is not to the exclusion of the factors that, of other factors that must be understood and made sense of in the situation of the black. As Fanon says, to quote him, it remains evident that for us, the true dis disalienation of the black man implies a brutal awareness of the social and economic realities. But what Fanon wants us to understand is that black alienation or the refusal of recognition that the black experiences in white society is not to the exclusion of the social and economic realities with which the black must contend. Rather, the alienation of the black and the resultant quote unquote inferiority complex that arises from it is the result of a tightly articulated double process, one aspect of which is economic and social and thus is exterior or objective, shall we say. The aspect of this process, the other aspect of this process is subjective and has to do with the internalization within the individual and thus within consciousness itself of this external alienation. Fanon calls this second aspect of the process of alienation the quote unquote internalization or rather epidermalization of this social and economic inferiority. Fanon offers in Black Skin, White Mask what he calls a socio-diagnostic aimed at quote unquote total comprehension of the situation as it registers in and upon the body 
that is rendered abject in this double process, namely the black body. For the black, um, for the black, in, the black finds him herself inside of a profound crisis of cultural imposition is Fanon's term, in which, um, in which his calling is towards whiteness and yet he seals, she's sealed inside of a black image that is ever and always an image of alienation, alienation from whiteness. The black is caught within a fracture of consciousness between a dark and a light side. This is quoting Fanon. Moral standards require the black, the dark, the black man to be eliminated from this consciousness. That's the end of the quote. For this reason, the black is constantly struggling against his own image, Fanon says, as the black has come to be lodged within colonial Manichaean hierarchies. This struggle is the struggle of what Fanon calls comparison, the struggle of comparison for, quote, the Negro is comparison. That is the first truth. The Antillian does not possess a personal worth of his own. He is always dependent on the presence of the other, quote unquote. And this is nothing less than bringing, um, and this is nothing less than bringing to colonial fruition the very logic of slavery that grounds the modern situation. Indeed, and here I give a longer, a little longish quote of Fanon. Indeed, after having been a slave to the white man, the Antillian enslaves himself. Fanon says. The black is, in every sense of the word, a victim of white civilization. To come back to psychopathology, let us say the Negro, let's say the Negro lives an ambiguity that is extraordinarily neurotic. This quite simply is because the Antillian has recognized himself as Negro. But by virtue of an ethical transit, he also feels that one that um, he also feels that one is a Negro to the degree to which one is wicked, sloppy, malicious, instinctual. Con continuing the quote, everything that is the opposite of this Negro of these Negro modes of behavior is deemed white. In the collective unconscious, black equals ugliness, sin darkness, immorality. In other words, he is Negro who is immoral." End quote. For my purposes, key in this passage is Fanon's claim that the Antillian is thrown into a situation in which he is made to recognize himself as Negro, which is to say as sinner rather than saint or immoral rather than moral. In relationship to, but he must do this recognition, this comparative work in, re in relationship to other Negroes to whom he compares himself. The Antillian who compares himself to the other so-called lesser blacks of the Caribbean, who all of whom compare themselves to what they deem the lesser blacks in Africa. This system of comparison is what they find themselves inside of, but all the while there's a deeper comparison, a deeper invisible comparison that's going on. The invisible comparison to the normalized transcendental other who Fanon says is the white man. In the colonial situation, the black is placed in comparison with other blacks for recognition due to a wider refusal of recognition from the white. By pressing psychoanalysis in a social direction and lodging, um, and lodging it inside of the colonial situation, Fanon is able to see the structure of violence internal to the fact that the Negro is comparison. Now, in chapter five, especially of Black Skin, White Masks, the chapter called The Lived Experience of the Black, Fanon pulls apart the structure of recognition and alienation the central pathology or psycho-existential complex that the black finds himself thrown into. It is here that he does a lot of work to explore the machinations of what he calls the governing fiction and failures of the social logic of recognition. And the key figure here for Fanon is the philosopher G.W.F. 
Hegel and the dialectics of lordship and bondage, of mastery and slavery that he theorized in the phenomenology of spirit. It wasn't by accident that Fanon felt it necessary to deal with Hegel. Many of the key French radical crit um, critics that Fanon was uh, in a conversation with were, um, were explicitly, and, um, um, both explicitly and often implicitly in black skin, white mass. People like Jacques um, Lacan, Heron, Bataille, Breton, Maurice Melo Ponty were participants in Alexander Kolzhev's lectures on Hegel's master slave dialectic of the late 1930s. As part of the emerging negritude movement, which brought an African presence into the heart of French intellectual culture in the 1940s, Fanon contributed to the wide-ranging Hegel discussion among French radicals. Hence, beyond even chapter five of Black Skin, White Masks on the lived experience of the black, the penultimate chapter of this book has a section entitled The Negro and Hegel. Already foreshadowing the arguments of political theorist Susan Buck Morris on the significance of the Haitian Revolution for any understanding of Hegel and the dialectics of freedom, Fanon subjects Hegel's thought on the master-slave dialectic, on lordship and bondage, and discussions around Hegel in the French radical intellectual circles to a kind of phenomenological reduction. Or better still, he, re he subjects them to what one theorist has called a decolonial reduction to interpret the dynamics of recognition within the colonial situation. A rough and dirty unfolding um, uh, or consideration of Hegel's master-slave dialectic in order to appreciate what Fanon is going to do goes something like this. For Hegel, the struggle for recognition takes the form of a dialectic whose terms whose nodal points are lordship and bondage, mastery and slavery. These two figures represent two modes of consciousness. How are these consciousnesses related to each other? They are related to each other through a third term, or what Hegel calls simply the thing, the sphere of life in which an object or goods are produced by the slave for the master's benefit. Thus, the master's consciousness is always for and toward itself, having power over the thing. But he also has power over the slave, whose consciousness in relationship to the master has the form of thinghood or property to be possessed. The slave's consciousness is a different mode of consciousness. His consciousness is not a for itself consciousness. It is a kind of annihilating consciousness because, not recognized, because he's not recognized in himself or herself by the master. It is only known, the slave's consciousness is only known through the work or the thing produced, which the master also controls. Fearing the absolute master, absolute lord, for the death that this master and lord might inflict if the slave does not work, the slave yet finds, nevertheless finds recognition by, objecti by objectifying himself in the form of what the slave produces. The work produced becomes a mirror back to the slave, a kind of reflexive moment by which the slave acquires a kind of recognition. In this objectified existence, the slave, to quote Hegel, um, the slave becomes being for self, or is being for self, or belongs to him, that he himself exists existentially and actually in his own right now. The slave thus becomes the one who exists truly for self in the Hegelian explanation um, of consciousness, and, this, and the master acquires only limited, indeed defective, recognition. It is the slave who knows that the negative moment of thinghood 
is brought, uh, it, it becomes a kind of, is a positive moment for consciousness um, and is the moment through which consciousness receives itself back through another. It's the slave that figures this out, which is Hegel's point. Okay, that's my rough and dirty kind of quick reading of the master-slave dialect. Okay. Knowing that the black was once a slave, Fanon knows that he needs to take seriously Hegel's account of the master-slave dialectic and its account of consciousness and subjectivity seriously. Fanon's basic critique of the Hegelian account of consciousness is that he intends the master-slave dialectic as an explanation of the meaning and destiny of quote-unquote spirit. He does not intend it, that is Hegel, does not intend it as a description, shall we say, of lived existence. Indeed, in the chapter on the lived experience of the black and throughout black skin white mass more generally, Fanon wants to explore, and this is a quote, how the perverse vertical distance uh, between subjects characteristic of slavery, I'm, I'm quoting um, a theorist that's been helping me think this through. This is not um, Fanon himself. Indeed, in the chapter on the lived experience of the black and throughout black skin white mass more ge generally, Fanon wants to explore the perverse vertical distance between subjects characteristic of slavery and characteristic of Hegel's representation of slavery in the famous master-slave dialectic. He wants to consider how this characteristic of slavery finds new grounds and levels of expression in the colonial relationship, which he sees as the new mode of slavery itself. Fanon sees colonialism as the new mode of slavery itself. In short, Fanon sees in Hegel's account of mastery and slavery a figure of coloniality or of the colonial relation. Hence Fanon's comment that the colonizer is not only the other, but also, it's the Hegelian term, the master. Or as Nelson Maldonado Torres has put it, imperialism appears in Fanon's writings as the institutional and geopolitical reinscription of the master-slave relation now in naturalized form. Empire becomes the world of the master and the colonial territory, the world of the slave. They are two distinct relations, two worlds apart, yet they are deeply connected by relations of subjection and forced submission. <clears throat> Fanon identifies in chapter five on the lived experience of the black the two sides of subjection anchoring the colonial relation to the master. They are the side of the Jew, interestingly, and the side of the black, who are quite different in the colonial order, but also deeply related in the colonial order. The Jew, who is an invention of the anti-Semite, says Fanon following Jean-Paul Sartre's um, work, The Anti-Semite and the Jew, is overdetermined from the inside and from within. In The Anti-Semite and the Jew, Sartre made several points about Jewish existence and the pressure on Jews to assimilate within an anti-Semitic culture. He found, he found important Sartre's description of the Jews' attempt um, attempted flight from others and from himself. Alienated from his own body and his emotional life, his, um, and his um, emotional life, the Jew has been cut in two. The Jew pursues the, uh, and this is a quote from um, Jean-Paul Sartre, pursues the impossible dream of universal brotherhood in a world that rejects him, end quote. Sartre argued that Jewish authenticity could not mean assimilation as it would amount to inauthenticity because it can't be realized as long as there, there is anti-Semitism. Now, Fanon discerned a kind of connection between Sartre's description of the situation of the late modern Jew and the situation of the black. The quest to assimilate as the quest to find salvation in a racist society necessarily leads to inferiority complexes neuro and neuroses among black folks. The flight from the Jewish self in the Europe, um, in, um, the flight from the Jewish self into the European self is Jewish alienation from his or her own body, argued Sartre. 
flight into assimilation for purposes of recognition cut the Jew's emotional life in two. Thus to be a Jew, argued Sartre, is to be quote unquote abandoned to the situation of a Jew. Yet it is also to realize one's Jewish condition, that this is a condition of abandonment in an anti-Semitic world, this abandonment requires struggle to overcome. Fanon saw parallels in this to the situation of the black. The black, is in many way, the black in many ways can be slotted where the Jew is, where, Fanon, where um, Sartre puts the Jew, and the races can be slotted where um, Sartre puts the anti-Semite. There is a difference, however. Whereas the Jew can find some measure of escape from the body through disembodied intellectualism, says Fanon, this option is not available to the black. For the black is sheer body. Now to be sure, the Jew is often read within the colonial and anti-Semitic world as body or anatomically different insofar as the Jew must be marked out, shall we say, in order to be seen as a Jew. This happens at the sight of the circumcised penis. The Jewish male is marked out as different in circumcision and in that sense in their faith, in their religion. But the black is pure uh, is purely anatomical and utterly different in the body and epidermally, though not just at the site of the foreskin, but at the site of the skin as such. These differences notwithstanding, Fanon sees that the Jew and the black function as a kind of joint scapegoat of the colonial European order in that both stand for evil that must be saved. They both must be conquered colonized, in some sense, missionized. But what authorizes this missionary project or saving work of conquest on the part of the master who now takes the form of the colonial other? It is none other than another, pro another projection of the master in the colonial situation which is tied to his unfulfilled desire for full recognition in the face of deficient recognition that he gets from the thing and from the slave. Where does the colonial master get full recognition? If the colonial master or the, uh, if the, colonial master or the white or the, uh, or the figure of the white projects and thereby creates the Jew and projects and thereby creates the black as evil, then the colonial master also projects or creates another that can grant him the full recognition that he needs in order to sustain his identity as a master and a colonizer in the imperial situation. This projection is none other than God. It is his vision of God that sustains the colonizer as himself an imperial God-man a figure who is, like, who is, who is a godlike transcendental other over against the slave and the colonized. Okay. Um, I have more things I, I want to say here. Um, I have another section that I want to get to, and the truth of the matter is everything that I was thinking out here, I just couldn't get on the page. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go to this last section because I want to make this final sort of constructive move out of Fanon. But there's a lot more that I wanted to say and have a lot more thoughts that um, are, have been racing in my head quicker than I could get them on the page for this talk. I can talk about them in Q&A if you like, but I want to get to this final part um, and begin to wrap this up so we can have a little bit of time left and begin to think through Fanon's response to this problematic. So far what I've tried to do is establish a, a, a kind of um, the way in which following Fanon, he sees the colonial situation as a situation of hailing and calling. It's the calling to be saved. I brought us to the point now where I've asked the question and um, suggested an answer of what authorizes the master to function this way. I've argued that there's a double projection that is happening. You must project the abject other, the black, the Jew, as the kind of negative foil and anchor for the colonial situation. But the other thing that must be projected out is a religious projection, the projection of God, right? And in this sense, we could turn to people like Feuerbach, um, in, in his um, um, classic kind of understanding of, relig of religion as anthropological projection. I want to bring all of that to bear on this and um, Feuerbach's own reading of what Hegel was doing. And there's a sense in which Fanon was discerning much of this himself, but reading it in relationship to coloniality. 
Now what I want to do is sort of turn in the direction of how Fanon tries to narrate a way out of this. And I'm going to suggest basically at root that this is where he's calling us to descend into the real hell of blackness to give us another way to interrogate and understand the colonial other. Not as the site of, of abjection, but as the place of a wound that is also the place of profound healing for us all. Okay, let me wrap it up, go in that direction. To overturn this religious production of death, or the production of religion as giving death, Fanon provides a kind of Christology, a kind of decolonial Christology in black skin, white masks. He does this not by invoking Jesus of Nazareth, but he does it by invoking his teacher, Amy Césaire. Drawing from the breath of Césaire's writings at the time, Fanon repeats the story of Christ's descent to and harrowing of hell from the perspective of the black man, most notably Césaire, who descends to the hell of the slave trading triangular circuit and finds and, as it were, kills the master of this hell arises and issues forth another kind of baptism. Césaire descends to the obscene and savage torrents, swollen with chaotic streams, rotted seas, convulsive oceans, the cold black laughter of cutlasses and cheap booze. Um, this is um, a quote that Fanon gives inside of Black Skin, White Mass from Amy Césaire. He descends to seas rotting with the bodies of those who did not survive the Middle Passage. And he descends into the degradation and horrors that were endured by those who did, in fact, survive. In Fanon's words, Césaire, um, Césaire, um, yeah, Césaire agrees to see what was happening at the bottom of the ocean. He agrees to see a vision which is not the kind of aesthetic mastery of the exemplary community, a vision, again, the ecclesial community that produces this. He doesn't want to see the exemplary community, right? Um, a vision that reduces the black person to object, thing, animal, beast, the biological, or remnant of primitive humanity. He sees by descending himself, not in the power of a masterful observer of life, but in an acceptance of all that white civilization has rendered socially dead. This is the quote, um, quote Césaire, by a sudden and beneficent inner revolution, I now honor my repugnant ugliness, end quote. Césaire accepts it all. And this again to quote from um, um, Fanon's notebooks um, of Return to My Native Land. I accept, I accept totally, without reservation, my race, that, um, that no ablution of hyssop mixed with lilies could purify. My race pitted with blemishes. My race ripe. My race ripe. Race ripe grapes for drunken feet. Césaire descends and is bound to all the human life that was and is in, was and is deemed unfit to live. Bound in bitter brother, brotherhood. To quote Fanon, quoting Césaire, that does not desire to separate to separate the living from the dead, but refuses to live through such separation, through the Manichaean world, a bond that finds freedom, not in the progression to or preservation of a higher civilized life, but, the, but in the indefatigable determination to hold on to and extend human love. Now I am only a man who accepts, uh, who accepts emptied of anger, nothing left in his heart but immense love which burns." End quote. Césaire descends, but he does not leave the black man below. In this holy descent, this, this harrowing of hell, Césaire discovered the white man in himself, the introjection of imitation. He discovers the white man in himself, this struggle to imitate, to assimilate, and kills him. The refusal of intimacy that defines white sovereignty is here confronted. For, to quote Césaire, the master's bedroom was wide open. In this brilliant lit bedroom scene, a scene bathed in light, a new kind of recognition occurs. It's you, he said very calmly. It was me. It was indeed me, I told him. The God slave, the faithful slave. I struck the blood, I struck the blood spurted. It is only baptism that today I remember.
end quote from Césaire. The master recognizes the insufficiency of his sovereign vision. It is you, the one I deemed a good slave, that has come to kill. The slave also recognizes himself with surprise. It was me. It was indeed me. In the confines of the master's bedroom, the space of white sovereignty internalized by the black subject, love and recognition are unmasked through and as violence. The operations of white civilization bringing to life those it imagines and incorporates in social, social death are unveiled not as universal truths, but um, um, universal truths about the superiority of white life, but as mere relations of violence and power. The baptism or redemption from this internalized white sovereignty and black insufficiency occurs once this master is seen directly, that is, once this master is removed from transcendence and now vulnerable to the advance of the other, is put to death. It is tempting to interpret Fanon here as fortunately or unfortunately repeating the very gesture of giving death in, the, in exchange for life that marks the colonial enterprise. This repetition would then carry with it either or both a continued practice of killing for life and or the deconstructive opening to a future that does not come from this practice of giving death. To refer to Derrida, uh, as Derrida has relentlessly argued, <clears throat> the return of the same does not alter itself, but does so absolutely, except by amounting to the same. Pure repetition, were it to change neither thing nor sign, carries with it an unlimited power of perversion and subversion. Without downplaying this trajectory whereby the center or origin, the sovereign community, is deferred and differed, um, distanced from its own self-identity and held to be essentially open to a future it doesn't control, Fanon's repetition, which is different from that, Fanon's repetition is not a deconstruction of the logic of mastery, but an attack on mastery vis-a-vis -vis the master. Mastery itself is the problem. To put it in the context in which Fanon wrote, his description of the vulnerability to, uh, to the white master is not a social ontology, but um, built on the vulnerability of the self towards the other. Such attempts to account for generic human sociality or generic sovereignty retract from the lived conditions, especially the violence and domination that define the relations between white and black in the colonial situation. The white man is not only the other, as I quoted earlier and will quote again here, says Fanon, but also the master, whether real or imaginary. This experience of life cannot be articulated or described in terms of an ontology. Any ontology, Fanon says, is made impossible in the colonized and acculturated society. Fanon's Caesarian Christology, if we may call it that, including the overpowering of the white master, is not a repetition of colonial violence and destruction, destructive or otherwise. It is an anti-colonial or decolonial gesture and concrete social and the concrete social structure prevents any parity or isomorphism between white and black. This anti-colonial trajectory leads to the profound and painful misunderstanding between Fanon and Sartre. Um, let me just summarize that because um, it's 6.35 and I want to begin to wrap up and make sure we have some Q&A. Um, basically, I point to hear about Fanon's um, uh, critique of uh, his friend, Jean-Paul Sartre, where Sartre basically comes to interpret negritude as simply a, um, a, inside the Hegelian logic. It's the, it's the moment of negation that needs to be recuperated back inside of a whiteness that now can take its difference inside of itself. It can assimilate that difference back, sort of in the way in which the negative moment gets assimilated back in the Hegelian logic. Fanon sees Sartre doing a version of that, and he issues a very strong critique of saying how this is, this is part of the, in, the, in, the engine and the energies of white control and domination, the ways in which it can absorb every difference back into itself. It can make space for the multicultural as a part of its logics of domination. And Fanon sees this and criticizes Sartre. Okay, so I lay that out, and then I basically conclude um, with a suggestion. I'm skipping a few pages here. I basically conclude with a kind of um, a gesture towards some aspects of Bart's thought in which basically we turn towards a, for, a form of Christianity that does not try to sustain itself, but that becomes basically a modality of weakness 
that requires, um, <clears throat> that requires God to sustain us. And in that way, to sort of take the, um, the, the sort of sting of mastery out of the colonial situation that grounds it and propels it forward. Okay, that's a, nice, that's a summary of everything that I'm leaving out. But I, I'm going to conclude there because I want to do a little Q&A. And I know we're starting to run a little close on time. So thank you very much for your patience. This was kind of long. But again, thank you for your patience and hearing me out.